Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Happy Friday to each of you. This is always an anticipated time of the week for us at NWC. Please take a moment to locate the chat and let us know where you are joining the conversation from today. Let's use the chat for some introductions. We are always thrilled when people show up for this hour to spend with us and our guest co-host. We would love to know where you are joining the conversation from. I am Dr. Nika White. I'm the founder and lead principal consultant for NWC, and this is Intentional Conversations, a virtual community vodcast where we intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership in business. And we welcome guest co-hosts from all over that bring different perspectives to the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So again, as we're getting settled in, I want to just let you know that cameras today are not at all required. They are highly recommended, but if you need to have your cameras off, then we honor that and respect that decision. But we do also love to see smiling faces. So for those of you who are willing to let us see your smiling face, please turn those cameras on. I'm being supported today by many of my colleagues at NWC who helped to bring this experience to, um, to life. And so I'm so appreciative of each of them and their support. I also want to take a moment to give a special shout out to um, Courtney Perry, my amazing colleague who um, actually led and hosted our Intentional Conversations podcast last week in my absence while I was traveling. So Courtney, you did an amazing job and I so appreciate you as well as Anam and Rachel and others that were supporting supporting behind the scenes. Now we do have closed caption enabled today. So if that's something that's going to benefit you, we hope that you will take advantage of that. This is our way at NWC showing forth a commitment to disability justice. And as you are joining the conversation and you're participating in the chat, I also would love for you to share your LinkedIn information if you're so inclined. This allows this community to be in touch with each other even beyond this time that we share on Fridays. And so we're going to jump right in. What I always like to do is share a bit of information with you before we bring on our guest co-host. And y'all, I am so super excited because we have guest co-hosts to cure it through the end of March of this year. And when I tell you that we're bringing the fire with people that I admire and I respect, and I cannot wait for you to hear from them. Um, but we get our guest co-hosts often by recommendations from this community. So I certainly encourage you to let us know if there's someone that you think should be a part of this um, Intentional Conversations podcast, you can send an email to our colleague, Courtney Perry. Her email is on the screen, Courtney at NicoWhite.com. We would love to engage them and see if we can get them scheduled. We also like to take an opportunity to share some courtesy resources that we make available at NWC for those who are really interested in continuing on their learning journey. And so we do short video clips and we release new content every week called Inclusion Uncomplicated. It's all about simplifying DEI. And so we encourage you to catch some past replays as well as to make sure you're paying close attention to when new content drops every week. Thank you in advance. So I'd like to take the opportunity to share who you have to look forward to in terms of upcoming guest co-hosts on Intentional Conversations. So on next Friday, January 28th, we will have Robin Grable, and I'm so excited because she is going to be talking about the importance uh, from a workforce perspective, considering those who are veterans, those who may um, be people with disabilities. And so we want to make sure that we are leveraging that population as part of our workforce needs and opportunities. And so I can't wait for that conversation on next Friday. And then following next Friday, we actually have our first speaker of February. And Michael is actually here today. He joins the Intentional Conversations podcast community quite often. And Michael is going to be sharing with us information about bias and how it shows up in AI and tech. So that's also going to be a wonderful conversation that I am so looking forward to. So thanks, Michael, for being such a great supporter of IC. And then the week following that, if y'all don't know John Graham, I'm going to tell you, get to know him. This is going to be an incredible conversation the second Friday in February on the 11th. John Graham is going to be bringing lots of great nuggets. He's going to be talking about uncovering ways to healthy Black psychology and owning our labor, right? Owning our labor. So it's going to be a deep conversation, but I know it's going to be a rich conversation, and I can't wait to welcome John Graham. So that's what you have to look forward to in the upcoming weeks. But for today, 
you have to look forward to Kim Crowder. And I'm so excited to be in conversation with her today and to share space as I normally do. I wanna give a um, formal introduction so that you all have the ability to understand the accolades, the lens, the credentials in which Kim brings to today's conversation. And then I will allow her to greet this audience in her own way. Kim Crowder is a certified Six Sigma leadership and diversity equity powerhouse who has been featured by Forbes several times where she was named an anti-racist educator your company needs now your company needs now. She is the CEO and founder of Kim Crowder Consulting, where her team uses a data-driven approach to partner with companies to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism into their DNA through building equitable systems and processes. She is a member of the MIT Technology Review Global Panel and Forbes, The Culture, and has been seen in the New York Times Business Insider, katiekirk.com, monster.com, on Cheddar News, LinkedIn, News Live and heard on HubSpot's The Growth Show podcast. And so in your own way, podcast community, please help me to welcome Kim Crowder to the conversation today. Let her know that we are so appreciative that she said yes to our invite. And Kim, as we normally do, I want you just to unmute yourself and I want you to greet this audience in your own way. And particularly, why don't you share with us some things that we may not know about you that we will not be able to find out about you from reading your bio. We like to get a little bit more in depth and connected to our guest co-host. And so thank you for being here and welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Uh, for yeah, I think it's morning for just about everyone probably <laughs> on, the, on the call. Um, my background is in marketing and communications. Actually, uh, Nika and I have that in common, if I'm not mistaken, that we both That's have that right. background. Um, and so, always thinking about this work, sort of from this 365 holistic lens. How does what's happening internally, communicate with the external. Uh, but if we just want to talk about something that's rare or different about me, I love travel, travel. I just spent three months in Italy. Um, I do that every year. I'm a, a bit of a nomad, not a total nomad. Uh, and what I love about travel is it gives me a perspective beyond the U.S. perspective, right? At least to some degree. Um, I also get a sense of what is happening in you know in a certain place and how does that directly Im impact the labor force so looking at how immigrants are treated in different countries uh looking at you know what does community look like in different places also i'm a singer uh, many people don't know that uh, i grew up singing i sang with beyonce as a kid um and i still do some singing around town where i live now uh, and so those are a couple of things that you just wouldn't know about me uh, by following me, especially on LinkedIn. Okay, look, hold up, hold up. We have a whole like list of questions relevant to DEI and we're gonna get there, but I'm sure that if I move too quickly into this, these audiences are going to start saying, Nika, they're gonna start sending me messages in the direct, in the chat saying, okay, we wanna know more about this. So you have to dig in a little bit deeper. Tell us about this other passion of singing and and your journey in that regard. This this helps us to know you better. <laughs> sure, yeah, I, uh, I've sang my whole life, I sang, Gosh, I started in choir. Actually, my choir teacher figured out I could sing um, and just started, you know, singing in school. I've done choral. I was actually started as a music major, but they only had classical training at my university. So I moved out into marketing and communications because my passion lied with jazz. Um, but I know what you all really want to know. When did you meet Beyonce? So I met Beyonce. <laughs> Yes, just go for it. Just go for I met, it. I met her at a talent show. I'm from originally from Houston, Texas, if there's any Texans here. Um, and she heard me sing and we a dance teacher heard me sing and the dance. We sang the same song, actually. The dance teacher asked me to join the dance troupe. Beyonce was part of it. And then uh, before I knew it, Beyonce said, hey, do you want to join my group? And that was we were kids. I mean, maybe 10 9, 10, 11, Kelly was around at that time, some other girls who aren't with, uh, you know, with the, or there is no more Destiny's Child, but you know what I mean. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I had the pleasure of, of getting to know Mama Tina and, and, you know, Matthew and being in the house, Solange was always a firecracker. Um, <laughs> but the way that that shows up now in my life in general, there's a real dedication that you have to have a discipline as an artist, but also as an artist, you are continuously being creative. And I really feel like this work in diversity, equity, inclusion, when we're talking about leadership, we're talking about being inclusive 
it requires a great level of creativity. Um, mm. It requires a great level of being okay with coloring outside of the lines. It also requires being able to listen to your audience. So in, in music, there's this call and response relationship that you have with your audience. And so I bring that, you know, when we do workshops, when we are, key, you know, I'm doing a keynote, what's the energy in the room? What does this room need from me? Um, and then what are they giving me back? And so those are some ways that I incorporate my musical training um, into the work that I do. I love that. Thanks for bringing it full circle and giving us that moment to kind of lean in a little bit deeper to the curiosities that I'm sure we're stirring in all of our heads, Kim. So that's wonderful. I also love the fact that you do a three month stint in Italy each year. I mean, I think that's amazing. Um, we, my husband and I are celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary in June and we have uh, a trip to Italy planned. So you best believe I'm going to be hitting you up just for some ideas and thoughts. <laughs> okay, well, let's jump right in. I want to make sure that we maximize our time to hear about all of your wonderful experience. And so I know that one of the things that you talk about often is cultural humility. Mm -hmm. And so for our audience, why don't you explain what that means to you and how can we all benefit from understanding cultural humility and its relationship to how in which we think about justice, equity, and liberation at work? Yeah, I, one of the things that I am so passionate about is our understanding that our lens is not everyone else's lens. Mm -hmm. And in that, even if you are a person from a historically ignorant background, I myself as a Black woman, um, that I can't understand everyone's, uh, everyone's viewpoint on things. And in that, where do I then back, you know, kind of back away from a conversation and listen in? Where then do I let someone else take the reins? And so that, to me, that is what cultural humility is. It's the understanding, the humility of knowing that I will not understand everyone's journey, nor will I understand everyone's challenges and struggle, which is why in this work, you know, we have partners that we work with, we have team members that we work with from all different backgrounds, making sure we're bringing those voices in. And then also being honest, if we don't have that lens, so, you know, we don't have that lens, but we may know someone who does. And so this work to me requires a large amount of being self-aware enough to say, Listen, we don't have a grasp on, on, on all of it and we never will, because as we know, the way that folks with historically ignored backgrounds are um, connecting with the world shifts based on what's happening out in society, right? The conversations are changing and we wanna always honor that uh, as, as a group of folks who consider ourselves global citizens. No, I love that. Yeah, cultural humility is so important. I often tell people that sometimes we try to drive towards political correctness, and rather what we need to be doing is building up our cultural competence, right? Because I think that is where we can gain greater perspective, understanding, compassion, support, standing in solidarity with others. So I love that we have that kind of shared message as part of our platforms. Yeah. So something else I want to delve into is, you know, companies often are experiencing challenges when it comes to how do I, what are those qualifications and those characteristics that I should look for in identifying a right DEI professional to lead this work? So I would love for you just to talk about what advice you would give to some of those organizations. We've seen such an influx of, of that discipline um, being um, ex more widely accepted, which is great. And I love that. But I also feel this sense of responsibility for organizations to be well equipped to know what to look for. I mean, sometimes I think they just find individuals who are part of some type of marginalized identity and say, go do this work. And of course, that's not the way to go. So just share your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, the first part of this, I would say for an organization, and it, it doesn't deviate, but it, it, it to me, it's the groundwork is the organization taking responsibility of the fact that this is organizational work. And yes. so whoever you bring in, is not, cannot be held responsible as the senior, uh, the, the solo owner of how this moves throughout your organization. That's a big piece because I do feel like companies right now are really leaning on individuals to move this forward within the organization, possibly without um, being unwilling to make some shifts in how the organization is structured. That's a big piece of it. In that, and when you talk about who, you know, how to connect and how to, um, uh, connect with someone doing this work. I think understanding the philosophy behind their approach and listen, there's no right or wrong way to do this work. Everyone has a different approach. I think organizations need to make sure that the approach that the person offers or the company or you know what, whoever, whomever offers 
is an approach that you and your work environment can handle. I also think um, it's important to know what's important to you. So for instance, one of the things I talked about the work that we do is around processes and systems. And so with organizations, making sure that they are comfortable with that, you know, what's the, it, it, that's our approach. Our, our approach is processes and systems. Does that match for your organization? Are you willing to, to make some moves in your processes and systems in order to make that happen? And then truthfully, I think also um, there is right now a bit of, in my opinion, uh, sort of this idea that only one person can do this work uh, as a solo. And I really encourage organizations to consider a departmental approach to this work uh, because one of the things I first talked about was that cultural humility piece. When you build a department, it builds the opportunity for there to be several people who have thoughts around this and also for organizations to really think about this work outside of ERGs, right? Assigning sort of this ERG group to do the work and really bringing in folks who have, uh, uh, who have studied who um, understand organizational structure, who understand, um, in my mind, processes and systems, but also uh, to, to make sure that the personality of that person can connect with your organization. That doesn't mean someone who won't challenge you. Yeah. That does mean have your leaders decided that whatever identity shows up in that group of people that they can yield to when it comes to this work. And so oftentimes in this society and culture, people from historically ignored backgrounds are not seen as leaders. They are not treated as leaders. And so can your organization, your, the leaders in your organization yield to those voices as they show up and say things that may not feel good or that may be contrary to the way that an organization has been operating. Yeah, no, that's really good, Kim. I want to I want to spend some time digging a little bit deeper there, and you've touched on this a bit, but I think that there's probably more to be said. Here, here's what I want you to spend some time sharing with this audience around: why understanding cultural nuances in the workplace is major key to success um, as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, justice type work. Yeah, the the what you know, I talked about my travel and why that's so important to me. And the reason why is because a lot of our workplaces are becoming these global enterprises, right? Where they have presence, people have presence from everywhere. And then the landscape of where someone may live versus in the US changes. So for instance, if we're talking about uh, India, for instance, there's caste systems in India. How is your organization thinking about that? How's your organization thinking about uh, people with disabilities and the way that they are experiencing on top of the fact that they, that English may be a second language. Are you, um, in, are you, you know, as an organization um, expecting for folks who are not in the US to assimilate into the way that America, you know, America, US does things in order to be accepted in that workplace. And so those are all the sticky points, right? Um, and which is why I say when we do this work, we really have to understand the makeup of a workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on top of understanding the makeup of a workplace, understanding the nuances of what that means. And so that is one of the things and also understand that the experiences in the workplace are based off of people's own cultural backgrounds, right? Yes. So the way that they experience the workplace could be very different. So I'll give you a, a, an example. One of the things we always say in the workplace is people who speak up are the ones who, you know, kind of like get, get, that, um, get that next thing or, or, or are made leaders in an organization. And there's a few things that can be challenging with that. One, we know that there, there are issues when, when, women, when women in general speak up in workplaces, mm -hmm. right? You have that. But also it's which women speak up and how they speak up. So black women can speak up and be seen as angry, for instance. But what about those women who in their culture, maybe they, that is not the way that they operate per se. They, or they may have had to learn how to operate, that, operate in that way. The assumption that anyone cannot be an introvert or loud spoken and still be, and not be a great leader that's where that there's some issues around when we talk about the nuances of this work. 
It's this association with what leadership looks like and leadership only looks like this one thing. And so when we start to dig down into the, the numbers and the data points around who becomes leaders within organizations, then you start to get a sense of, huh, is this because we've only defined leadership as this one right. thing? What is that about? And so that's what I mean around sort of those nuances and why it's so important uh, for us to really start having those conversations so that we can understand all of the different ways that we need to yield as, you know, as organizations, organizational structure, as leaders, that we need to be yielding to the cultures that we have invited into our organization. Mm -hmm. No, that's so good. You're getting lots of love into the chat as well. So your, your, your voice is resonating with, with people that are connected here today with this community. So we, we both referenced at the beginning that we have a commonality in our marketing communications branding background. So I wanna go there for our, just a moment. I understand just from some of the preparatory conversations leading up to today that it is your practice to offer inclusive branding strategies to clients who are doing or have done DEI work. And I love that as a, as a code of conduct. So can you just talk a little bit about um, why that is your approach and how in which you navigate that when you maybe find yourself in communications with someone who is seeking your support, but perhaps you don't feel like they really have done all that they need to do in committing and showing forth that level of commitment to DEI. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is we've run into this before. Uh, you know, one of the things that we are committed to is that this work isn't sort of, um, uh, oh, what, there's a language around this, and it, but it basically that this work isn't empty. Yeah. I think that there's a hollowness to this work. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen organizations create these external campaigns that do not match their internal workplace. In order for me to do this work with integrity, we just can't get on board. In order for my team and I to feel like we there's some real integrity in our work, we can't get on board in a way, one, that um, is truly respectful of communities and identities, but also it is not going to yield a company what they want. Yeah. And so we have had to have some hard conversations with organizations when we walked in the door and said, okay, we're going to work on this branding piece of it but when we start to dig down we recognize that that other part even though it is desired to be done they're not ready yet so we've walked away from organizations where we said hey come back to us in six to twelve months and we can reshape this conversation but today we don't feel comfortable creating sort of this external connection when internally you all have not done the work at a level that we would feel comfortable with and you know listen <laughs> My hope is that organizations respect that language mm -hmm. um, and respect that honesty, uh, but whether they do or not, I can sleep at night. And that, yeah. is, that is the biggest piece of it. And so that's what I would say, you know, around our approach and why it's so important is because what we don't want is for an organization to become a money machine around mm -hmm. a certain group, but do, does not have that internal uh, workplace structure that can support the same people who you know, you're selling to to come into your organization and be a part of your organization and, and not have that same, um, that same welcome in the same way that, that, is, uh, that they may be displaying that to an external audience. No, good for you. I mean, I think it's important um, for those of us, you know, practitioners in this space that have really deep convictions about this work that we do, um, we're very reflective about what are those non-negotiables that's going to allow us to feel good about the work that we're doing. Many of us that are in this space is because, again, we care about this work. And so there definitely is a process by which we are vetting potential partners to see if we are a fit for them the same way that they're seeing if, you know, they are, you know, the vice versa. So it works both ways. So one of the things that you mentioned in earlier conversations, um, again, in preparation for today, is you use language on purpose, subliminal messaging. And I want you to explain what this is and how are you using it to bring a DEI lens to the area of entertainment and media? Again, still stand in this vein of like the branding marketing communications. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I think of two shows that are my favorite right now who have done a really great job. And one is Insecure. Uh, and uh, what Issa Rae has done, in my opinion, has been absolutely revolutionary 
not that we have not seen all black casts, but in the way of looking back and seeing the showrunners behind the scenes, seeing who is in, involved in every single part of the, every single part of the, the construction of a show. And mm -hmm. also they brought that to a younger audience. Uh, because when we have seen shows like this in the past, oftentimes it was re related more to family, a family structure. And what Issa Rae and her team did was made it just normal to be a normal person. Nobody is like this super, um, you know, nobody's like winning the Nobel Peace Prize. They're just people, people on a daily yeah. basis who get to be normal and human. That's one piece of it. But also, if you watch the documentary, you watch how many opportunities Easter Ray created for folks yeah. who did not have access on a regular basis in that industry. Then I move over to another one of my favorite shows. I'm like, both of them are ending, which is so unfortunate, but this is us. And when you look at This Is Us and the writing, in This Is Us and the way that the nuances of different groups have been brought to the forefront, whether it be uh, you know, having a, a child that is blind, or uh, whether it be someone who had, who you know, feels like they have had issues with their weight or alcoholism or being yeah. a lonely black person or what it means to be in a black family or you know, like, or what we saw, how they highlighted, um, uh, I can't remember who he was, but basically he had, it was a, a, a showing, how, well, well, I can't remember exactly what it was, but basically they brought in some history as some historical aspects that we may, may not have known about. Um, and that it was a person of color who invented um, this major computer or tech thing. And so what I love about This Is Us and I've read up on the writer's room is the way that they divide those stories is who gets the loudest voice in the room depends on their background and their experiences. And so in those episodes when they're writing about specific things, those folks get to have more of a, 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 a pen in the conversation, they are leaned upon as the experts. And you see that and you feel that if you've ever gone to Twitter or Facebook after an episode of This Is Us, particularly a pivotal one, and you see people's responses, you go, oh, that hit, it worked. And so those are, if I can just you know, think about two shows that are really doing that right now. And we, we're seeing some of this also move forward. Uh, Netflix has done a really great job in a lot of ways of, of bringing in more inclusive Right. Um, writing, HBO is working on it. And so I hope to see more, but also more in the way of the people behind the scenes who are actually creating the opportunities that they are the ones who have access and power to move these stories forward. Yeah, no, I, I remember reading about all of the intentional efforts behind the scenes that um, Issa Rae, where she was leveraging her influence to bring about those opportunities for others. And so I, I love that. And, and those two shows are definitely um, fans among, among many, just based upon the chat. Uh, so I want to circle back to something that we mentioned before, and this is actually um, a curiosity that's come up from one of our audience members today, Tony Etheridge. Thank you so much for being here, Tony. And I am happy for you to unmute if you would like to share your question directly, or I can simply just present what you shared into the chat. I'll give you a second to see if you unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank okay, you. Okay, welcome, welcome all. Hi, Kim. So my question is, you raised something really um, special, uh, and I like the fact that you had mentioned when you sit and dig down with some organizations and you find out that um, they're just not prepared in terms of the approach of your organization going in and helping them. So I'm just curious, when you have to step back because of integrity, which is definitely bound down to that, how does... What does that look like? Have you ever re-engaged and that company or organization is just still not there? So are they left on their own to kind of figure it out for themselves? And then I think that there's this space where that's work that's still not being done. Not to say that your organization has to do it. Of course, they should do it themselves. But I'm just saying it seems like there's a there's a missing piece where we're just leave, where that company or organizations are saying to kind of figure it out and, and they can't figure it out because they know something is just a disconnect. So I'm just curious about that, how your approach, your organization has approached that, whether you've connected back with them and helped them or if you just leave them onto their own device. I'll pause. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a few nuances to, to that response. And, and frankly, we've only had to do this once. So I just want to you know be transparent in that. This organization in particular, you know, sometimes it is that your team members get it but your leadership may not. And so there is a tension in that. 
especially if your leadership is the one making the decision around how this moves this forward. And so it's not always that the whole organization does not connect, but also, as I mentioned before, it could, yeah, and someone mentioned Mindy, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot remember the name of the show right now. I'm sure somebody can put that in the chat, but I've watched all the episodes with the teenager. Um, as I mentioned before, there can be a tension when you bring in a, 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 a woman, when you bring in a woman of color who is providing direction. And if someone in that leadership is not necessarily had that eye to eye relationship, there can be challenges there. Um, there can also be uh, challenges around the fact that they have built their audience specifically around a certain group of um, folks who, who are um, maybe in intentionally non-inclusive. And so when you ask how to bridge that gap, sometimes what it is is we just, I mean, we certainly always tell the truth around here's why we don't feel like we're the right fit right now. But we may say, here's some ways that you all may wanna move forward. You all may wanna connect with X, Y, Z. You all may want to do X, Y, Z. So we don't necessarily leave them hanging, but we also don't um, come up with a strategy for what they should do in the meantime. That if, if we're not, if we're not the, the team to do that work, then we need to leave space for whatever team they choose to, to actively lay that out for them. They may have an approach that could work better for that organization. Um, and I, I also wanna say this, and, and this could be right or wrong, but I never feel an onus on myself to make sure an organization does the work in the in-between. Yeah. I don't. Um, I don't feel like that's our work forward, not for my team and I. There is, a, there is for us a, a level of at what point we will even engage with an organization, depending on the work that they've already started doing. Everyone does not do that in this space. Some folks engage with an organization who has done no work. We don't. Um, and some of that is for our own safety because my team, all of my team members are from historically ignored backgrounds. And I have to make sure that my team members are safe and that our approach, which we feel is a bit progressive because we're talking about processes and systems, um, that they can be okay, that they've already started thinking along those lines. And so that is just our approach. There, again, there's no right or wrong to that, but that is just where we are. So we don't necessarily feel an onus to say, here's what you need to do in order to get ready for us. We may give them two or three things to do and say, here, consider this, but we may not be the, the right team today to do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Tony, I so appreciate your question. And Kim, I, it's resonating with me, your, your response. And I do think that it's important for us to shed light on the fact that just like other disciplines and industries, not all DEI practitioners are created equal. You know, I love the fact that there's so much interest in this space and in this discipline and people are bringing their own special superpowers to their approach, their lens. And I think it is part of the responsibility of organizations to be mindful of that and do their homework. I love when um, prospective clients will reach out to us and they say, we're shopping around. Great. I want you to shop around. We don't right. pretend to be all things to all organizations. And so we have a certain set of, of questions that we engage in that discovery conversation, um, those prospective clients with. And, and yes, we're fortunate to be able to be selective about what we say yes and no to because we know yes. what's really within our wheelhouse and, and, and those types of relationships where we really can help make impact. You know, So I, I very much appreciate what, um, what you just expressed and shared. So um, we, we talked a little bit about, of course, the media and the entertainment. And by the way, if you all are, are finding, you know, that you need some plans for the weekend, lots of great recommendations have been discussed today. Um, if you want to binge some shows or, you know, to catch up, um, you can certainly uh, you can certainly do that just by reviewing the chat today. But what can those in the media and entertainment space do to build stories that are equitable and humanizing? We've given examples of those who do it well, but there's still a plethora of others that totally miss the mark. Mark. And so what would you share? Yeah, I won't name anything. <laughs> I won't name anything. I do feel like um, there are there are quite a few that missed the mark. I'll give an example. Actually, I was watching a show, which the show itself, the plot line was great. The show was done well. The only two characters in the show, it was a small town. The only two characters in the show 
of color. One was a drug addict and the sister of the drug addict who was trying to help him not. And it was very much so um, unfortunate that you can have all of these professionals and nobody sort of dings that mm, maybe this is off. I think in, to, in 2022, for any show that has a cast of all one group of people, time out, like really it is time out for that. But also if your writer's room or even your producers particularly are of, of only one background, that is like basic where we can start in this. The challenge is, is that the industry very much so is still laden with, um, because it's a power and money sort of, yeah. you know, uh, uh, set up um, that whoever has the most money and even if their reputation isn't so great, or they may have some things in the past, a lot of things go un, uh, uh, sort of ignored in the industry. And then we hear about it 20 years later where, you know, people have been sexually harassed for years and years and years and everyone has known about it. So it's, you know, entertainment is an interesting beast. Um, I do think that because we are now seeing folks being able to um, produce shows via, the, via YouTube and those become popular, that provides a lot of open space for people who may or may not have naturally had um, access to, to places. Also, um, with social media, you're able to make connections that maybe you weren't able to make because you don't live in LA. So now, yeah. right, people are, are in the writer's room via Zoom. That's beautiful because now you can involve more of those uh, conversations. And also, one of the things I do really love is that we are seeing shows um, that are not American based become popular mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. um, we look at Parasite. Um, we look, I still haven't watched it. It's like uh, the Hunger Games, but it's not the Hunger Games. I like the Squid. What is it called? Some Squid, squid yeah, Game. Squid. Yeah, Squid Games. <laughs> yeah, and so we're starting to see some of that become a part of of um, uh, uh, we're starting to see a more global concept around this. Um, I watch shows that that are based in Africa, for instance and love them mm -hmm. on Netflix. And so starting to see some of that come into play is exciting. Um, and we've also seen kids shows do a very great job of this. Like Sesame Street has done an excellent job. Yes. Over the years of continuously evolving on a regular basis. Um, we're seeing in, in uh, the, in, what is it? Encante? Encante? Is that right? Um, Are you talking about, it's been all over social media where the little kid with the curly hair was like, mom, that's me. Yes. Also, yes. Yes. And so we're starting to see more of this happen. Um, so for those shows, th the reason I mentioned all of this is that for those, sh for those shows that are still using the excuse that we can't find people yeah. that, you know, this is the best way to tell the story. We know that's not true. The money tells us that's not true. Black Panther, look at what Black Panther did in the box office. Like we're starting to say, you know, this does not work anymore. And so what's the alternative here? My hope is that we start to see more showrunners from different backgrounds, that we see more ownership of, uh, of studios uh, or more CEOs and presidents of studios who are writing those checks, who are green lighting um, these shows that that starts to look differently. We have a long way to go around that. But on that, on that micro level around people involved in those shows, we are starting to see some change in that. And a lot of women are stepping in and, and in that director's chair. Debbie Allen has been doing this work for years, years, years. She's a, a, you know, a Houston, um, she's out of Houston, Shonda Rhimes. So we're seeing people come to the forefront, um, uh, Mindy as well, but we could certainly use more. Yeah, no, I am, I'm totally with you on that. Um, and I hope that you all are thinking of some questions that you want to present to our guest co-host. In just a moment, I'm going to shift and allow each of you, if you feel so inclined to unmute yourself and share your contributions or your questions directly, or you certainly can feel free to place them into the chat. We are curating those questions, my team, and they're sending them to me. And we would love to make sure that we get your questions answered. And so I want to address um, the state of, of black women in the workplace. I know that anti-racism is part of your platform. And you know, as, as you mentioned at the top of the hour, you're a black woman. That's part of how you show up also and the lens that you bring to this work. So these specific challenges that black women and our black professionals in general experience at work, there are many. What can organizations do to best support them? That is a, a, a strong question. 
I would say the first is to understand those challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in understanding those challenges, not putting the onus on those professionals to tell you what those challenges are. There's enough information out there to understand, or at least to at baseline, I wouldn't say understand because I think that's a strong word, um, but there is enough research out there and great studies to, to at least be able to scratch the surface of what those unique challenges are within an organization. I would also say, uh, again, not putting the onus on those groups to bring change forward. Yes, they can be involved in those conversations, but their labor in doing it, which is why I have a complicated relationship with ERGs, right? Um, <laughs> Tell us about that. Tell us about that. We want to know. Um, yeah, you know, around ERGs, a lot of this is done voluntarily. You're doing this with very passionate people. But what we find is that those conversations are happening and, and, and stop there. They aren't being uh, given a real path. They are in some way, you can have a connection to leadership. You may have leaders in the space that you wouldn't normally get to talk to, but if there are not actual um, strategies and, and goals put in place and measurements of success, then it's sort of a room full of people that continue to talk. But when you talk about all of those three things, measurement of success, strategy, all that should be paid for, right? Nowhere else in an organization are we asking people to create strategy and not be paid for it. Absolutely. And so that is what I say by my complicated relationship with ERGs. Do I think ERGs should not exist? I'm not saying that. Do I think we need to reshape the way that we talk about um, uh, ERGs or so employment resource groups or affinity groups? Um, those need you know, to, to reframe what we think about those. And then also when we talk about um, how can companies understand, I think really companies need to understand the societal systemic issues that show up when you are integrating, because that's what workplaces are doing, integration. What happened when we integrated schools? If workplaces would go back there and take a look at what happened, that's happening in the workplaces. It may not be as outright, right? <laughs> and so if, if workplaces could connect what happens during integration, then they can then start to go, oh, could there be some resistance when someone shows up as a leader in the workplace who people have deemed don't deserve to be a leader no matter what their, um, their accomplishments are or their, their expertise is? when they say that they've experienced some sort of um, resistance, not just from their people, you know, who are above them, but even the people that they are leading, even then they can find resistance because those folks aren't used to uh, taking, you know, taking uh, expertise from someone in that position. And so that's what I mean, you know, again, we're getting into the nuances, but organizations to start to do their own homework and to look at the numbers around this. We continuously see that black women are having, not having great experiences in the workplace. There are numbers to support this. There are studies to support this. And what I also think is important, Nika, I know that you feel the same way, is understanding that uh, qualitative and quantitative data. Yes. Because the way that this shows up in your workplace may show up somewhere differently. And so if you aren't listening to, if you don't hear or are not listening to those stories around how this is showing up in your workplace, then you really can't treat it because you're kind of guessing. And so that's why I always, you know, Nika, I imagine you always start a relationship off with an assessment. What does this workplace look like? What are the conversations that are being had that even though, um, even though you haven't heard them are being had, but also what are folks based on societal norms um, considering good enough, even yeah. if it's not good enough? Yeah. You and know then, can, yes. And then disaggregating the data. You know, sometimes okay. we like to see those those big, yes. you know, percentages of the aggregate totals. But if you break that down and you look at it by different, you know, demographics, there's a new story that is unsurfacing, right? And you have to deal with that. And so right. Yeah, you are, you are all in on my street with everything that you just said a moment ago. Lots of good commentary happening into the, um, the chat as well. And so, yes, um, some folks were needing some clarification around ERGs, employee resource groups, affinity groups, also known as business resource groups in many organizations. And going back to your point, Kim, 
If it is a business resource group, that word business is directly connected to commerce, the bottom line, the ROI. So how can you not see that as strategy? And if you do see it as strategy, how can you not try to compensate your ERG leaders for the heavy lift that they're doing to bring forth some of those solutions? And so, yeah, this is really good conversation. Yeah. And we know that companies put money behind what they value. Yes, absolutely. But I feel the same even about those who lead like the, the, the DEI committees, because sometimes yes. that's the oh, only absolutely. way. That's yes. the only way in which there's an internal infrastructure to be able to move that body of work along is to have a group of enacted leaders that can do that. Pay them, pay them. Yes. You have expectations of them, pay them. And I'm going to the bring and shift there and also, excuse me, Nika, but shift, no, their, go for it. shift their responsibilities as in yeah. they cannot have the same workload and be expected to be on an ERG group and be effective. They cannot be the lead of a committee and then not have any of that work shift. And so also yes. they need to be compensated in time and in, in financial resources. Yes. And one of the steps that I think a lot of organizations miss when it relates to like the ERG leaders, your folks who are serving in the capacity of, of leading your, your DEI committee council work is that they don't even make it, um, make it easy for those individuals to be able to engage. And so for example, I've had a lot of folks to say, well, I really wanna you know, give more time and energy to this DEI council or ERG, but my supervisor and my teammates are looking at me sad eye because now, you know, I'm spending time in this other regard. So the step that was missed was leadership. Are you preparing also your people leaders to know that they need to release and support all of these folks who are doing this other work that by the way, it's not extracurricular. It right. is really important to who you are as an organization, right. mission critical, business centric work. Right. Okay, I want to get off the soapbox because I can stay here all day. And it sounds like Kim, you can too. So, so we're going to shift a bit. And, um, Ann Kingston, I'm going to actually spotlight her as well to bring her to the conversation. She has a question. And Ann, welcome. I want to give you an opportunity to present your question at this time. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really enjoying today's discussion. Um, I am in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm kind of getting started as a DNI practitioner. So I'm interested in hearing from you, Kim, when you're kind of reflecting over your career and especially in the early or like getting started stages, obviously, you know, what we're looking at in terms of impact is all about the long game. Um, so was there any points that clicked for you where you realized like, this is my calling, I'm making a difference, I'm seeing a shift in the people that I'm supporting. Yeah, so I, why don't I tell you why I got into this work? Because I didn't choose this work. Um, and Nika, you may have a very similar story to me, but this work sort of like knocked on my door because of the <laughs> level of discrimination I was experiencing in the workplace. And it wasn't just, it was, it was, it, it started to, to impact my um, mental, physical, emotional, psychological well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that, I also had an experience with EEOC. And what I saw was that there is such a gap between what is okay in the workplace versus what the EEOC deems as egregious. And in that, the sort of living hell, living workplace hell that I was going through, um, I started to push for things. I started noticing that there was a willingness to pay white folks more than black folks. I mean, I'm just not gonna even make it any prettier than it, and it is, um, particularly black women and by tens of thousands. It's not, it, you know, these are not small numbers. I started to notice uh, the way that we hired, that there was some real issues in the way that the organization was hiring folks. I started to notice how, what the, cause I was in the C-suite then, what were those conversations in there? What was allowed from some employees versus others? So I started to really understand the nuances. And then I started pushing into our policies and going, hey, we, we're laying out this policy, but why? Why is this policy worded this way? Or why is this, you know, what are, what are our policies around performance improvement? And why does that seem, do the rules seem to be different for this group of folks and this group of folks? Um, talking to the board about things like this. Now you imagine I was not, I was no longer the favorite employee by any means. Um, and I was also for a long time, the only black woman in that room in particular. And so it, it did not win me friends, but what it did win me was experience. 
And so if your question is, is what are, what should you be considering? I think, uh, and it, you know, I'm, I'm just who I am and I'm just gonna say what it is, is that of course I'm going to make an assumption, but you present as a white woman. You may not be a white woman, you present as a white woman. And so in that presentation as a white woman, that cultural humility is going to be imperative for you. Um, because some of the biggest barriers in the workplace for me were white women. And so in that, the level of trust that you have to build, particularly with your employees who do not have the benefit of presenting as white, you'll have to do more work around that. Um, and so being aware of what that looks like, but also I would say deciding what your lane is. So what is your lane? What, is, what do you feel like is going to bring the, bring the most progress forward? Is that processes and systems? Um, or do you wanna focus on cultural humility? I, I, am a, I am a proponent of processes and systems work. Um, and so in that, what training can you get around specifically processes and systems? And then how you add the DEI lens to it. That's why I did Six Sigma Leadership and DEI certification was because I wanted to see those separately. And then how could I marry those two? So just to say, you know, really being intentional about your, your learning and your growth in this is going to be extremely important. That's great. Thank you so much, Anne, for your question. Um, so Kwabana, I want to actually have you to come and share your question. I want to say your full name to you because I, I feel like you were quite intentional to put your full name and I want to honor that. Kwabana Marcus J. Collins, would you like to unmute yourself and share your question directly? No problem. Good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for allowing me to join you all today. I've, I'm a regular on this call, um, always very beneficial. So that being said, just taking a step back into the conversation around BRGs, ERGs, and for those who aren't um, clear of the difference between those is ERGs are more of for the employee specifically to make sure that they feel comfortable in their skin or allowing them to the resources to be able to navigate a, um, a culture that is not necessarily consistent with that of their own. And then a BRG, the concept is that they are going to be used as resources to build strategy for the um, betterment of the business in addition to um, the employee. So thinking about um, impact versus just uh, impression. And so my question is, some organizations, though I, I've heard of some organizations that are starting to compensate people um, additionally for being parts of BRGs and ERGs, but then there's some other organizations that I know that are respecting the, that there is value and there's real work that is being done in the BRGs. And so what they're doing is they're removing some of their workflow that um, from their plate and supplementing that work with the BRG work. So what are your thoughts on that concept versus um, you know, just adding, you know, a $1,000 bonus or something like that for being on the ERG, the BRG. Yeah, and my, and my- I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say quickly, there was a little bit of background noise. And so I wanna make sure this audience was able to hear the question. So I'm just gonna, you know, succinctly repeat it. It's, um, so Kwabana is interested, Kim, in your thoughts on when companies shift work to BRGs, as opposed to just offering them the extra compensation, seeing that the work that they're doing really is a value. Uh, so, uh, Nika, can you say that for me one more time? Because I think I heard something a little different from him, but I want to make sure, sure I- Sure. What are your thoughts about when companies shift work to BRGs as opposed to giving them extra compensation for the extra work that they're doing? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it's clear that I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a fan of that. I, I, one of the things I heard was, you know, companies, uh, as opposed to um, adding it to the salary to it being a bonus or that sort of thing where yep. the conversation is ongoing. That in my mind, that's the only way that this can, can be um, beneficial. I would almost say that companies can look at it almost as a stipend. And so deciding, you know, are there, is there a term in which people, um, you know, sort of serve in this capacity and in that what's the stipend and what does that stipend look around look like around time? 
And what does that stipend look like around a uh, financial uh, investment for, for their, their labor, basically? I also think it's important when we, when we think about this um, that companies need to be aware of the natural propensity of people who have been historically ignored to be a part of those groups. And in that, what are the unique challenges that they face as being a part of that? And so what I mean by that is, are they the only ones who are doing that work in the workplace? Right. And so really thinking about the, the, the sort of makeup of those groups. Um, do I believe that those folks should have, you know, especially if you have that experiential piece of it uh, and you have some, some real sense around strategy, um, to have the loudest voice, yes. But should they be the only ones doing the work in the organization? I would say no to that. Um, because it again is putting the onus on the people who are experiencing it to sort of only be the ones who can come up with ways to, to eradicate it. And then yeah. also one last thing I would say is to make sure that they understand the difference. You know, what is your company interested in? Is your company in interested in inclusion? Are they interested in equity? Are they in in interested in justice? Are they in interested in restoration? Because those are all very different things. And so making sure that the lens by which this is the focus, that that is also clear as well. Yeah, and as I think about the timing, you know, we're coming up on Black History Month. I like to refer to it as Black Heritage Month. You know, Black excellence is not just about the history. It's also about what's happening now as well. But there are a lot of companies who will heavily lean on their African-American Black ERGs, BRGs to plan the Black History Month, Black Heritage Month type of celebration. And something that I have been sharing with a lot of the clients that we work with is let's shift that thinking. I mean, yes, to your point, Kim, you certainly want to make sure that whatever you are, are planning, it's going to be meaningful and it's going to be certainly, um, you know, a feeling of, of, of acceptance by the, the, the Black colleagues in the organization. Um, I mean, of course, everyone, but definitely the Black colleagues, but don't put the onus and the burden on them to plan an opportunity to help celebrate Black excellence, right? So I often say you need to make sure that you are, you are taking the lead on that and not having that to be on the shoulders of, of you know, your, your small percentage, which is often the case of, of Black employees within your organization. And I would also say, how can we, how can we expand this idea of celebrating Blackness in the workplace? beyond yeah. this one month. Exactly. Um, these groups are coming in, they don't have a budget. They don't have, um, or if they do have a budget, it's very small. They weren't giving the green light. Let me tell you something. If anybody's walking into your organization sharing their expertise around building inclusion in the workplace in any way, they are just as strong as any person you bring in who speaks about leadership because they are talking about leadership. And that is one of the things that I am so passionate about is that we continuously talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion as if it is different than leadership. So some people will say, well, can you find a message that's, that everyone can relate to? Everyone should be relating to this message. If America wants to continue to present itself as a tapestry nation, as a nation that is um, sort of built in this way as a melting pot, which I have a heart, I have a problem with that language. But if that, if our workplaces want to continue, say we're inclusive, then the level in which you talk about this, this has to be at the same level, if not elevated from the other, you know, the other areas of strategy and operations that you were talking about in the workplace. And so my issue with even quarantining sort of, you know, this idea of black history or black heritage into one month in it itself is an issue. Uh, this is 365 days of the year. I'm black every day. I'm excellent every day. <laughs> you know, all of my people are. And so um, thinking about it beyond that, I think is extremely important. Absolutely. That is such a strong note to, to end on. I, I love that. This relates to everyone. And um, so thank you so much. So we are almost out of time. Um, Kim, I just want to thank you for sharing space with us, for sharing so many nuggets and gems with us. We really do appreciate the work that you're doing. We appreciate your leadership. And uh, we look forward to continuing to follow your success. I want to thank all of our audience members for sharing with us today. If you found this information to be helpful, then um, allow others to be made aware that they can catch the replay 
play. But Kim, I want to give you the final remarks. What would you like to leave this audience with that perhaps we haven't touched on today? Yeah, uh, one thing I would say is this is so important, uh, Nika, that this that you're doing because community is the is the cornerstone yeah. of change. Mm -hmm. uh, solidarity uh, is the cornerstone of change. When you look at history, those folks who have been the most dangerous, Martin Luther King, when he became the most dangerous, was during the when when he was doing the Poor People Campaign. When you think about Fred Hampton and and what happened with Fred Hampton. And the Black Panther Party, it was the connection with other groups who were also being oppressed. That was the danger. So that's the good work. You know, when we talk about the good work, and I, I also want more of us to remember or, or at least get some historical context around what solidarity has looked like and that that just did not start today. Because what we find is that people are going, I don't know how to do this work. People who look like you have been doing this work alongside of people who, from historically backgrounds for years. Yeah. And so do your homework and find out what that has looked like. The last piece that I'll say is um, it is okay to take breaks from this work. Mm -hmm. It is okay because this work is extremely taxing. Uh, Nika just went to Jamaica. Is that right? I, just I did. <laughs> Listen, so finding those times to take a break and to, to remove yourself from this work without guilt I think is extremely important at times. Uh, and th that would probably be my last piece. And also I just wanna congratulate Nika on the new book that's coming out. I'm sure she'll be talking about that more, but I saw that this morning and my heart just went a burst because I love to see black women continuously pushing the envelope and, uh, and, and doing the work in such um, unconventional ways so that we all take notice. So congratulations on that too. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, there's nothing left to say. You have you have dropped the mic like every minute on this hour, and we're just so grateful. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you all next Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe, and thanks for joining the Intentional Conversations podcast.